All right. Uh, welcome back to Extra AI Podcast Series, your podcast on AI and machine learning applications. And this is, as you know, we are doing video podcast in season nine. And today is the season nine finale. And this is this marks our first season finale of the video podcast. And today we are honored to have Robert Mayako join us to discuss a profoundly and very important topic responsible AI as a force for good. Robert Mahiko is the co-founder of INSEAD AI. He brings the rich tapestry of experience and leadership to our discussion. INSEAD AI is an alum-led global community that unites thousands from the INSEAD network, including alums, students, professors, and staff around the transformative power of AI. Prior to this, Robert was a senior leader at three of the world's leading strategic consulting firms, which many of you will know, McKinsey, BCG, and Oliver Wyman. In these different roles, he led initiatives across dozens of countries and worked with some of the most prominent global clients on various transformative efforts. He has been a multi-entrepreneur in consulting, having helped start new offices, practices, and client relationships from scratch. Today, Robert is an advisor to corporations and an investor in various companies, ranging from startups to several PIPO firms. So in this season nine finale episode, we'll explore how AI can be harnessed responsibly to create positive impacts in the society and discuss the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead in ensuring AI acts as a force for good. So join us for this captivating finale to a groundbreaking season as we delve deep into the ethical implications and the transformative potential of AI with one of the leading voices in the field. Don't miss this insightful discussion on Extra AI. As always, we'll provide you more information at the end of the podcast. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation. All right, uh, welcome back to our uh, Extra AI podcast series. And today I have uh, the pleasure of uh, talking with uh, Mr. Robert Majeko from INSEAD. Uh, he's the founder of INSEAD AI. Robert was previously a senior leader of three of the world's leading strategic consulting companies, like McKinsey, BCG, and Oliver Wyman, where he led dozens of countries and uh, Third, some of the firm's most prominent global clients on transformative efforts. He was a multi-entrepreneur in consulting, helping start new offices, practices, and client relationships from scratch. So today he's an advisor to corporations and an investor in various companies from startups to uh, several pre-IPO companies. So welcome on board, Robert. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raghu. So let's start with our um, uh, this uh, question, uh, Robert. So let's start with the big picture. So what do you what do you like listeners to remember about the current state of AI? We know a lot is happening out there. We you know, not only AI now we have a lot of generative AI related stuff going on. So what is the big picture that you would like the listeners to remember when we talk about uh, what is the current state of AI? Thanks, Raghu. I, I would like to start big picture. Let's not get lost in the weeds. So here's five things I think uh, you have to understand about today's AI. First, despite all the advancements, all the press releases, today it, today's AI is pretty primitive. It has significant limitations. When we look back in a few years, we'll see this AI as quite primitive. Second thing, basically nobody uses it, right? R roughly 2% of the world's population is using uh, generative AI daily proactively, so it's very low penetration still. Third, 10 to 20% have even tried it. And the, the ones that have tried it have often tried less sophisticated versions. So ChatGPT uh, 3.5, for example, free versions, and have no idea yet what the capabilities are. Um, fourth, and this is, you know, uh, I think the key takeaway for the listeners, fluency in uh, AI, and by that mean, I'm uh, that I mean understanding capabilities, who are the key players, is as essential as learning English. You cannot work in uh, 
business globally without understanding English and having a, a fluency, as I call it in AI, is just as important. Gift, and this is the exciting part, I, I suppose, also for listeners, we're at the beginning of an S-curve. Mm -hmm. um, we are in very early days. This offers significant potential and opportunity for the early experts. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, I think uh, I completely echo with your thoughts and echo with your uh, uh, thoughts about all these five different points. So I would like to now pivot this and talk a bit about, uh, ask a bit about the INSEAD AI, the INSEAD AI community that you have uh, been actively, uh, you know, actively started and like, can you tell a bit about how INSEAD AI came up to be and how anyone can benefit from it? Like, is it only the volunteers in INSEAD or is it the external world as well? A, a few thoughts of it. Yeah, you're actually part of the beginning story because we met at the hub for the Americas conference. So we started the INSEAD AI community following um, Sam Altman's firing. Everybody was talking about what the heck's going on. Uh, we we're also inspired by a talk a week before when you and I were together at the INSEAD Americas conference at the Hub in San Francisco, near OpenAI headquarters. Sam couldn't attend then, he was supposed to, but he sent instead his uh, Chief Operating Officer, Brad Lightcap, who I think you'd agree gave a quite uh, enlightening presentation. So that was the scene where we started. So we launched a WhatsApp group. We thought a few people would join, maybe a few dozen. And within 30 hours, the group was full. We had 1,024 members. Somebody was joining from around the world every minute. So there was huge interest. Um, the group is inclusive, and I think it's unique in INSEAD history in that. It's open to students. It's open to alumni. It's open to staff. It's open to professors. And all four groups are, are, are quite active, and I don't think we've had such a group before. Uh, it's possibly the largest and most active INSEAD group. Uh, we have thousands of people sharing resources, job opportunities. We had a, a pretty high a senior job uh, opening that came up recently. Uh, tech tips, insights, uh, people are collaborating. We've helped INSEAD in creating new case studies. So it's it's getting real. And our content is part of some of INSEAD's courses as well. Um, in the group, we have exclusive spaces for INSEAD members. Um, so there's some things that are private, but there's some things that are public as well. Uh, I would point out the INSEAD AI YouTube channel. Anybody can find it by looking in YouTube, INSEAD AI. Um, and we also have podcasts on Spotify and Apple Podcasts um, that I usually lead. Um, and besides that, I, I make a weekly update. Um, it's open source, so, so anybody in the world can access it of everything the community has shared in the past week. Um, and it's it's a lot. Uh, though I tried to summarize what I think the top five stories of the week are, and I make a video about that. Uh, that's available uh, through YouTube. There's a link there through my LinkedIn or directly uh, on my profile on, on Medium. So there's a lot of information that's open to the public that's uh, been shared by these thousands of scouts of AI, in fact, the insiders. Uh, the initiative's designed to ensure that INSEAD as a whole and the whole community is at the cutting edge of AI and that we lift all boats, that we, we make sure uh, that we are um, steering the future of, of AI to the extent possible. So that's a great introduction um, you gave, uh, Robert, about INSEAD AI and uh, what's happening there. Uh, but what about AI and what about the business leaders out there? Are they ready for all this innovation that's happening and are they ready for what's happening in the world out there with AI and generative AI? What are your thoughts when you met with some of these uh, business leaders and publications? Mm -hmm. Of course, like you mentioned in the SF Hub. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can speak to the NCI AI community. Uh, it, we see in the group and from work that Professor Jason Davis has done, he did a survey of NCI alums, that the NCI community is really at the forefront of using um, AI. Uh, in his survey, uh, Jason Davis showed 68% of people were already using chat GPT-4 soon after it came out, so uh, by far early adopters. Even at that time, when there were a lot of fears in the world about AI, nearly half of them were more excited than, than, than worried. 
about AI's futures, but they're clear-eyed. They're not just cheerleaders. They're cautious about how AI might be misused and, and risks to privacy issues such as that. What's also clear is younger uh, INSEAD grads are particularly active in engaging with AI and there's strong interest really around the globe from the Americas, Australasia, Europe, uh, Middle East, Africa, basically everywhere there are INSEAD alums. We have very active participants that are, that are doing things. Europeans who are a big part of the INSEAD community are a bit more cautious, um, but it's close. Uh, they, they see some potential downsides. Um, overall though, I'd say leadership from this group, from INSEADers is crucial, especially as we aim to have AI as a force for good. So a model of, of INSEAD. With our 60,000 quite uh, prominent alums, we're in a strong position to shape how AI evolves and, and is used in industries worldwide. Beautiful. So I think uh, like you rightfully mentioned, I think the younger community or the younger crowd is much more uh, easier or much more comfortable in using these technologies, uh, whether it is AI, aggregated AI, but of course, uh, uh, there is, there are reservations, as you rightfully mentioned, there will be reservations when you talk about AI and generative AI, because I think uh, when we talk about geopolitical or regulation or a lot of other things which we will go into. Uh, but before getting there, I want to first start with uh, uh, maybe if, if you can share some thoughts about what are the issues you see when we talk about businesses and AI and what are the most critical questions that you keep uh, getting when we talk about. So, I, you know, you might have seen the recent Deloitte research. It said that only 6% of US companies who are uh, more leading on AI on, on average, only 6% of those companies give access to official generative AI apps to 80% or more of their staff. So it's a very early days, half, uh, give access, basically official access to, to almost none. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, I don't know if you saw it, but there was a recent Moderna case study. They managed to integrate AI across all levels of the operations, including basically 100% penetration. Uh, 750 custom GPT models were deployed in just a few months. They're working with OpenAI uh, on that. Uh, and they had a rapid and pretty comprehensive uh, adoption process. And there's some lessons we can draw from, from that uh, for organizations to leverage and uh, adopt AI effectively. So let, let me talk about some of those. One, leadership involvement. So leadership's direct involvement driven by the CEO, as seen in the Moderna case, is crucial uh, to get company-wide adoption. Number two, and you mentioned this, uh, ethical AI use and having policies. So you do need to have clear ethical guidelines to govern AI use, and you have to make sure it aligns with your organization values, but also more broadly societal norms. Um, three, using AI in strategic decisions. So this is interesting in the Moderna case. It's not just some edge applications that are, are not mission critical. They're looking for AI to help them build new drugs. Uh, and to foster an AI first culture so that they can do that and move quickly uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, next, they have, if you look at the case study, and I, I do recommend it, I've written about it as well. They had comprehensive AI training. So that meant individualized AI training, partially using AI uh, to make sure each employee had a learning companion to get on board, to have deep understanding um, and they are very much pushing continuous learning, which is key. As you know, every day there's new stories coming out. A few other things, um, they created AI forums. They had regular meetings uh, to have communication, ID sharing, and just to grow enthusiasm in the company. Uh, also in the case study, you'd see they had incentive programs, contests to identify and empower uh, AI savvy employees. So they were looking for champions to make this all work. So I, I point out this case study because it's one of the best I know of a company really going all in and uh, going to be AI focused and AI driven. Mm -hmm. So 
one of the things I wanted to kind of um, get a bit deeper into this aspect, right? I think we talked about ethical um, case studies and ethical issues when we talked about AI. Uh, so this is where uh, ethical issues is one thing and then data privacy issues is one other thing and then regulations. These are the three big things I'm kind of looking about when we talk about AI because these things change or these things are different when we talk about the different continents or different countries around the globe. The things in North America or US are different, Europe is different and China and other countries are different. So what do you see uh, uh, the competencies here and what are your thoughts about how things will go from here? Yeah, this is fascinating. And we see this uh, in the INSEAD group, especially because we do rep represent different geographies. Um, there is an AI race going on. Uh, right now it's US and, and China. Europe is part of it as well. Uh, and it's a chess game of innovation and, and regulation. And everybody's playing to their strengths. Uh, let me go through a little bit what the current situation is. US, US leads in innovation, the best AI models, the best AI chips. Uh, but of the three, it has a lighter regulatory approach. We basically have no comprehensive AI regulation at all in the United States, uh, which raises concerns for various people about privacy, ethical governance, uh, potentially safety as well. China's different. Uh, it combines very strong government backing and in theory, strict control, though you can argue that in fact, they don't implement some of that they aim for global AI dominance. Um, but that also raises some concerns given that everything has to be according to party norms. Um, and there are some other issues I'll get into in a second. Europe um, focuses on rigorous regulations. You know, we had the EU AI Act to make sure AI is uh, ethically aligned. Uh, they seem ready to sacrifice speed for public trust and, and sustainable development. Um, and we can argue many have whether that's the right approach or not for, for Europe. So linked to all this are some, some other technical issues. Chips. Chips are, are sort of the, the core of the story. So cutting edge chips are, are key to AI strength. And the U.S. holds an edge clearly there with NVIDIA um, and in general in chip, chip tech. However, the U.S. has export controls on, on China for the most advanced chips. So the most advanced NVIDIA chips are not, not allowed to be sold to China. This creates a lot of tensions, and, but also shows that China is vulnerable in this area. Uh, and it's the main reason China is pushing towards self-sustainability in, in chips. Uh, ironically, <laughs> the Western world relies on the actual production of these chips on Taiwan which China considers its territory. So I, it, this doesn't feel like a long-term stable situation. We do have to find solutions uh, here, I believe. Finally, open source AI models um, play a big role in this whole uh, discussion. Meta leaked its first, or the, its first model was leaked, not officially by them. And its next models were put out by them, open source. But that also meant that China and anybody in the world had access to the latest AI tech. And China is fully leveraging that, fully leveraging open source to bridge its uh, tech gap. Uh, so that's an important part of it. So each region is playing to its strengths. US is moving ahead, very innovative, uh, thanks to its tech giants and startups as well. But regulations are light. We have to watch that space, what's actually going to happen. We have an election year, uh, possibly not so much given that but we'll, we'll have to watch that closely. China is ambitious uh, and wants to be, in fact, the leader in AI, but it's heavily reliant so far on foreign tech that may change as their own tech develops. Europe is focused on ethical development, uh, mm -hmm. but we'll see what that does to their innovation as well. So, so it's an interesting, very interesting chess game. Yeah, I think it looks very interesting. And of course, this. AI competition or the race for the dominance is going to be interesting for the years to come. Like you rightfully mentioned, while US does all the innovation or leads with innovation, China has a lot of potential there. Uh, with China, with all the adaptation and the controlled adaptation, 
Uh, and then, of course, uh, when we talk about data privacy laws and regulation and other things, of course, Europe will play a big role there. Uh, so we will, it will be interesting to see how this will play out. But I believe uh, you recently have done an interview, I believe, with uh, one of the red team members for Chat GPT-4. Do you see any broader questions as regards to the AI safety? Uh, maybe do you want to talk a few words about that? Yeah, I, I learned a lot from talking with uh, the red teamer, Nate LeBenz in this case. Very, very, very uh, interesting fellow. In, in any case, he has a podcast called Cognitive Revolution, which I'd also uh, recommend. Uh, he's an AI scout who's always looking at the, the latest things going on in AI. And his insight into working with the chat GPT-4 model long before it was public is, is very eye-opening. Um, first thing that he said, and he said, in fact, three times in our discussion, AI does not automatically align with safety. Uh, it has to be a deliberate design and you have to have continuous oversight to ensure it operates as intended. Um, second, there are risks of powerful AI. We have relatively, as I said, primitive AI right now, but as AI becomes more autonomous or as it be becomes an agent that actually takes actions on your behalf, uh, the risks can grow substantially. Third thing we discussed is that AI development is surpassing by far the pace of creating effective safety measures. So we might prematurely deploy before we really know what we're deploying and having all the tools to, to, to manage. Um, next, there's a big gap between AI developers and how, what they know and understand and oversight bodies to the extent there are any uh, and their understanding. They often lack basic understanding of how AI works, making it really hard for them to oversee its uh, adoption. So we need broad engagement. So AI governance should extend be beyond the internal teams, the uh, individual companies. There should be third party audits, uh, Nate argued, and also whistleblower protections from inside companies if they see things that uh, could be harmful. Uh, that's been an issue, uh, in fact, in, in AI. And ethical guidelines must be early. So he had access to a very raw, powerful model, still pretty much the most powerful model uh, out there. And he got it to uh, suggest very extreme actions, you know, regarding violence and things like this without ethical filters. So it very much highlighted for me the importance of having robust safety and ethical guidelines from, from the start. Right, I think some of the important points or some of the very key points you have raised, uh, I believe are based on um, AI doesn't understand the ethical outcomes or the safety outcomes because you will have to define what is the outcome. You, you will have to provide, okay, I need this kind of an outcome. So, but for that outcome, AI wouldn't know how you have to get there. So that is where all these guidelines and uh, ethical practices have to be built. I think uh, it's a beautiful thing that you have mentioned. Uh, but for individuals, when we talk about, uh, I know there are a lot of guidelines out there. There will be, there will be obviously, when you are building, uh, there will be developers building without uh, the big, the big firms and the big governments, I think maybe they go in a in a stage where they will have all these controlled guidelines and controlled development, but there are smaller players because they have to come into the being. And so they have to kind of, for the sake of uh, gaining the market share, they might build some of these solutions, which may not have that uh, trustworthiness or safetyness. So there are things that you have to take care. But from the individual standpoint, uh, what are the challenges that you see uh, to like uh, how you can overcome? What are the key challenges that you see when you want to learn about AI or how do you want to adapt AI or save AI and how do you overcome that? Any few thoughts that you would like to make? So, so I'd, I'd like to reflect here, Raghu, on, on jobs, so how people stay employable in the AI age. I had a fascinating discussion with the INSEAD alum 
Ashley Recanati, that, that interview is available uh, online. He's written a book, uh, which was one of the first books on this topic. And a few points from, from that discussion and things I've observed. One, and I've mentioned this before, basic knowledge of AI's capabilities and limitations is essential. So for everybody. Uh, so if you are looking to have a job, you have to understand what's going on in AI. Second, I would embrace AI tools to raise your productivity now. Uh, you're not waiting for the next generation. Hopefully your company uh, allows you to use certain tools. Uh, the thing is about jobs, jobs might not totally change, but tasks will. And the definition of a job and what tasks are included in that job um, will, will change because AI is going to do some of the tasks or will significantly accelerate how they're, how they're done. So workers will have to be flexible and continue to, to, to learn. Um, some things, routine things, mainly routine things will be automated. Uh, but that also creates new opportunities for you to focus on complex and creative fields. What you have to do to stay relevant is to focus on developing cognitive skills, things where you have to think creatively, um, things that AI can't easily replicate, things that revol uh, revolve around human interactions are more defensible, or if they're cultural nuances, they're less vulnerable to AI uh, disruption. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, AI could widen the gap between the high and low skill jobs. So there used to be more of a pyramid, but the middle might be hollowed out a bit as some of those jobs can be automated away. So you have to escape to the higher end where more cognitive, more human skills are, are needed, where things are a bit more complex, a bit less routine. And if your company is not thinking about these things and is not allowing official AI access, you have to also look if you're in the right company, make sure you're in a company that's ready and, and will survive. Uh, in the coming future. Beautiful, beautiful. So any key steps uh, individuals have to take uh, to kind of address some of these challenges that you have uh, mentioned, right? Like I say, uh, I say uh, you, you, you did mention a few things that you'll have to do, but I think any in, uh, steps that individuals would have to take to kind of uh, reach where they are, to start that. Oh, exactly. So I, uh, I'd like to go through a few things that uh, beginners could be interested in, but also experts. So maybe some of the experts haven't are, are not doing all of these things. Um, if you're a beginner, you can start with some fundamental courses like AI for Everyone on Coursera. There are a bunch of AI videos on YouTube to grasp basic concepts. We have a section called AI 101 on the INSEAD AI YouTube channel. So I, I would recommend watching some of those if you haven't seen those videos there are some really good basic uh, uh videos to understand how ai works and some of the key aspects we also have a section there called ai essential vids uh so or essential videos which are usually the leaders in ai and so you hear straight from the source what's the latest uh, uh we update every week so mm -hmm. you can get a lot of excellent content there hours of content uh, basically every week we also put their um, news and, and other things generated by insiders. Second, if you're not subscribed to a newsletter, you should be. Uh, there's like Rundown AI. There's many newsletters. You have to find the one that's right for you. It depends what you want to do with AI. It might be more technical, might be more practical, might be more business oriented. There are newsletters that serve, serve each. Similarly on podcasts, I listen to many podcasts, many, many podcasts. Um, and, uh, I try to listen to get as many different points of view as possible, you know, the technical, the business, the, the practical, and there are tons of options on Apple podcasts, uh, or Spotify, your podcast, obviously, uh, is a key one. Um, over time, I've learned how to listen, uh, at double or sometimes even triple time. Once you understand the concepts, the jargon and the way of speaking of your favorite podcaster. You can listen more quickly and, and you know, absorb the same amount. So I find that uh, as a hack to, to get through so much material quickly. You can join communities. All Insiders should definitely be part of the Insider AI community. I would recommend AI books like Ethan Mollick's Co-Intelligence. So I, I've 
been telling everybody that I uh, asks before you ask me about AI, please read the book. Uh, you can listen to it in four and a half hours, so it's it's not a big challenge. You can if you speed it up, you can do it even quicker. Uh, and there you get a pretty broad perspective about AI, some practicalities, but also ethical considerations and what AI might become and what that might mean for for all of us, for humanity. It's an excellent book. Um, one of our professors, uh, Henning Kazunga, also interviewed Ethan. That interview is available on the INSEAD AI YouTube channel. Uh, that's a good place to start as well. It's an excellent interview, very good interview. There are other courses you can take, paid or free. I won't go into all the options there. But if you haven't done hands-on things like work with paid uh, models like ChatGPT4 or the latest uh, uh, Gemini, you absolutely have to do that at least for, let's say, 10 hours, as they say, the 10 hour rule to get a general understanding. You should use some uh, image generators as well. If you had ChatGPT4, you have Dolly there. I like Midjourney at the moment the best. Uh, Adobe Firefly is, is also a model if you use Photoshop where you can play and see what can be done. I do recommend that everybody make some music uh, with Suno or, or audio. Uh, it's pretty amazing. You put in a text prompt and you get out a song uh, just to have an understanding of how this all works and what and start to get a, an idea where this all might lead. Um, more advanced personal projects. A bunch of our Inside alum have made GPTs or gotten into more advanced topics using Python and such. If, if that's your uh, interest, that's certainly something you can do. Uh, and some of our alums have been sharing their learning journey. So they've been talking about what the best courses they found were, but also in general, their reflections. Uh, and that's a way to consolidate uh, what you're learning. So th those are some very practical uh, ideas that uh, I would recommend considering. Before we go to the uh, key highlights or key takeaways, are there any questions that you would like to post for me? Maybe yeah, so tables. finally, <laughs> get to ask you it, turn, turn the tables. Um, so you have a lot of experience and I wanna talk about use cases. What are some successful use cases you've seen implemented or are about to implement in AI or Gen AI? Uh, any measurable outcomes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, um, uh, Jeff, uh, for, uh, Robert. So coming from the enterprise standpoint, uh, this is what I keep talking when I, when I talk about uh, the enterprise AI use cases, the complexity kind of doubles when we talk about consumer AI compared to enterprise AI. Because here, we also have to focus on not only just the customers, but also our customers' customers. So this is where the complexity doubles. So we did, we do have, uh, I will talk in the aspects of uh, business applications or business processes, whether it is a procured to pay application, or I'll take a simple example of uh, a sales order being created and how do you realize that sales order and how do you see the benefits? Uh, so you start with a sales quotation, there are a lot of quotations which come via emails or maybe phone text messages or other things. How do you automatically uh, scan them and upload into the system and then create a sales order out of it? And when you are creating a sales order, there is a lot of information that you have to get. It. So this is where while scanning the sales order, uh, while scanning the sales quotation and creating a sales order, we do a lot of machine learning and AI. Now, we also started using generative AI technologies. When you are creating a sales order, there is a lot of other textual information or description that has to go into the sales order item. So this is where key elements you can extract, but there is a lot of other textual information that you could definitely add. And so this is where we see some of the generative AI examples uh, and how we can increase the productivity of the internal sales representative or the sales uh, representative so that he can create a sales order faster and realize and then follow the sales order and how the uh, outcome is achieved. And then I can go on and on. There are a few other use cases when I talk about procurement ticket. You have a procurement specialist. You're ordering a lot of items at your uh, shop. 
you know some of these things are not generated or not delivered on time. So you will know ahead of time that there is some delivery delay on one particular route because this particular clamp is not functioning well. So can I automatically schedule so that it can come from a different location? So there are some of these use cases we have uh, been working. Uh, of course, we keep hearing to our customers a lot, build and then enhance these use cases. So this is how we measure our outcome based out of uh, how you can increase the productivity of your users and reduce the costs. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, it sounds fascinating. Uh, and it, I can understand the complexity of having your customers have customers uh, and, and making sure that the whole process is is positive for, for, for all of them. Um, given that we talked, you talked about procurement and, and uh, what functions are seeing the most uh, implementation in generative AI? We, you know, we hear about customer support, uh, call centers, uh, sales, marketing, software development. Are there any non-obvious ones? What functions are you seeing uh, as the main ones yeah. Yeah. and interesting one, ones as well? Yeah, so one important function, which is um, non-obvious, uh, uh, which is where we are seeing a lot more um, generative AI uh, capabilities being adapted. Like for example, the HR functions. So when you are onboarding a new employee, what kind of uh, information or what kind of uh, trainings that you will have to get this new employee when you send? Or even before um, onboarding the employee, even hiring the employee, the process of hiring itself, there is a lot of generative AI happening with the recommendations the skills matching that you are doing. Because now you, you get hundreds of resumes, and then you will have to pick up some of these keywords and understand, of course, there is always a human in the loop, but how can you help the human uh, maybe process this information faster and then get to the next step? So I would say the process of uh, hire to retire is one very important process where at each stage, uh, there is a lot more. Uh, uh, so, so I would say the HR function is one thing, which will be in, uh, using this quite a lot. And there are a lot of other functions I would not want to go into this. I know, uh, so we are, we are coming to the end of the conversation. Uh, do you want to provide any key takeaways or highlights for our audience? Yeah, sure. No, thanks, Raghu. Thank you very, so much for, for having me. Um, what I'd like to leave is this. Remember, just like learning a new language, starting in AI uh, might seem daunting at first. In fact, it might seem daunting when you're deep into it because there's so much coming and so many new things to learn. But with uh, persistence, access to right resources, you can. And in fact, you must navigate it effectively. Uh, what you should remember is there are no true masters. There are no total experts, even people claim to be, in fact, do not understand the totality of AI and its impact on our society. Uh, and everyone starts somewhere. So dive in without fear. And I'd like to leave, uh, reinforce three resources. I think everyone, uh, whether you're a novice or an expert, should should tap into. One, Ethan Malik's book. Co-intelligence. I don't get any uh, money from that. I just think it's the best place to start. Uh, number two, if I chose the podcast besides yours, uh, I would talk about the AI breakdown. With Daniel Whitmore does a great job every day summarizing some of the latest uh, news. And I would subscribe and follow the INSEAD AI YouTube channel. Uh, I do a weekly news update where I talk about the top five stories, and there's a link to everything that's shared from the INSEAD community there. And as I mentioned, they're top AI videos, 101 resources, and the latest from, from thought leaders. So it's a, it's a good resource. Uh, I, you could also, if you want, subscribe on mymedium.com to, to get that directly into your inbox. Uh, it's all open source. It's all for free. Um, so those, those are th some things I'd, I'd, I'd leave the audience with. Dive in and, and keep going. Beautiful. I really... Uh... I think some of these resources that you mentioned, I'm already following. I think that's a great way of uh, 
keeping you updated on what is happening. Uh, because uh, like you've mentioned, I think things are changing at a very fast pace and we need to kind of not only understand what is going on, but you also have to digest that information and then how do you implement it. So beautiful, I think um, thanks for all that uh, great insights, uh, Robert, as always. Uh, so love to get you back uh, some other time again. Thank you for having me and thanks for doing this podcast. I mean, and, and sharing your insights with, with the world and bringing guests to the world. Uh, really appreciate that. So as we draw curtains on an incredible season nine of Extra AI, we first would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to Robert Maiko for joining us in this powerful season nine finale, Robert's profound insights into responsible AI and its potential as a force for good have not only enlightened us, but have also inspired thoughtful discussions about the future of technology and its role in the society. And of course, uh, a tremendous thank you to you all, our dedicated audience of Extra AI for being part of this wonderful journey to our first video podcast season. Your engagement and curiosity have made the season a very memorable one, filled with enlightening conversations and groundbreaking insights. As always, I'll be tagging Mr. Robert on this LinkedIn post. And if you have any further questions or if you want to engage with him, you can directly reach out to him. Alternatively, you can also reach out to me, Raghu Banda, on my LinkedIn profile and I can put you in touch with me. You can also reach out to me on my other social media handles like Twitter, or X, RK Banda, or Threads, RK Banda. And of course, you can always go to our website, extraai.com, www.xtraai.com. And then you will find there humongous amount of other episodes and other conversations uh, and maybe a lot of other blogs and podcasts and other things. So as we look ahead, we are excited to announce that season 10 is just around the corner, promising even more interviewing episodes and discussions on the latest developments in AI. So stay glued to our extra AI for another season packed with expert insights and explorations into the ever evolving world of AI. If you have any suggestions or uh, uh, new conversations you want us to bring in, let us know through the feedback. And one final thing to say, if you haven't subscribed to the Extra AI podcast yet, now is the perfect time to do so. Subscribing will ensure that you wouldn't miss out on any of our upcoming episodes. We, most of the time, we release the episodes every weekend, every Friday, uh, barring the end of the month. So you, you see, mostly we will be releasing three podcasts in a month, and the fourth podcast is more like a recap of the, the fourth uh, weekend. Thank you once again for tuning in, and we look forward to welcoming you back to Season 10 of Extra AI, where we continue to explore the fascinating interface of AI with our world. Until then, have a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening wherever you are tuning in. Happy predicting the future with AI technologies. This is your host, Raghu Banda, signing off. Thank you and bye-bye.